America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight we bring you another mafia story as we explore the life of a young man born in Sicily but raised in America. A young man whose youth during the Great Depression would see him enter into a life of crime in order to obtain that ever elusive American dream. Join me, your host, Guinness Walker, on a journey fraught with personal tragedies, high-profile assassinations, and some of the most powerful organized crime outfits on the planet as we document the criminal history of Vito Scaletta. This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Aussie, Die Castinator, Chuck K45, Miles Garrett, and King GTA 15. All of you are amazing, and your support is something I can't fully express my gratitude for. Thank you all so much. And this episode is brought to you in part by my executive producers, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Die Castinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story-based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story-based games to come. Mason Collins podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment, fixing it up, and starting a new farm from scratch. And Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models and much more, with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying, selling, and trading the diecast cars. All links in the description down below. Thank you to all of my patrons, and please consider signing up if you enjoy my content. Every little bit helps, people. Even if you can't support me financially, though, support the show by showing my executive producers some love. And without further ado, enjoy today's video. Vito was born Vittorio Antonio Scaletta in the small village of San Martino in northern Sicily to Maria and Antonio Scaletta in the May of 1925. His early life would be one characterized by poverty, and eventually in 1932 at age 7, he, his older sister Francesca, and his parents would emigrate to the United States of America, settling in Sand Island, Empire Bay. Vito's parents would move to America hoping for a better life, the American dream as it were, but they would soon learn that America was no stranger to poverty or exploitation, as Vito's father Antonio took a job working for union boss Federico Papalardo, who had connections to a world Antonio's son would one day be very, very familiar with. Antonio would take to drinking quite heavily to cope with the realization that he would likely never be able to drag himself and his family out of their destitution, and this habit would also lead to the family needing to borrow money from loan sharks to pay for Antonio's increasingly destructive addiction. Vito would grow into a young man on the streets of Sand Island and quite quickly find himself tempted by the allure of committing crime to get ahead. If the American dream was never going to come to him, he sought to make his way to it. Sometime in the late 1930s, Vito would meet and become good friends with Joe Barbaro, the brawn to his brains, and together Vito and Joe would rob and steal to get what they wanted, but eventually, all good things must come to an end. In 1943, Joe and Vito would be caught red-handed breaking into a jewelry store, 
and in their attempt to escape the officer pursuing them, Joe would narrowly avoid capture, but Vito would be stopped just a moment too soon. When arrested, Vito, now 18 years old, was able to be tried as an adult and would be given a choice, go to jail or go to war. No prizes for guessing which option he took. Being of Italian descent, Vito would be assigned to the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment and participate in Operation Husky, the Allied invasion of Sicily. Though he was meant to be dropped in southern Sicily, his squad's plane would be hit by flak, forcing all aboard to bail out, with only three of them surviving the strike, Vito among them. Dangerously behind enemy lines, Vito and his surviving squad would aid the local resistance fighters combating Mussolini's forces in the small town of San Celeste, until nearly being overrun by armor reinforcements. The rest of Vito's squad would be executed by Mussolini's soldiers, but Vito would manage to survive, just barely, with the arrival of a wild card, the dawn of the Sicilian Mafia, Don Calò. An entire garrison of troops surrendered that day. Why? Because he told them to. Following Operation Husky, Vito would be sent to fight the Nazis on the European stage of the war, and whilst doing so, his father Antonio would die when apparently falling into the water at the docks drunk, and subsequently drowning. Vito would eventually be shot on the battlefield, but once again survive, and spend a short time in the hospital recovering before being given a month's leave to return home and see his family. Unbeknownst to Vito at the time, however, he would not be going back to war, at least not the one that he thought he was. Upon returning to Empire Bay, Vito would be greeted by his old friend Joe Barbaro, who, far from sitting around simply waiting for his friend to come home, had been quite busy making a name for himself in the city's budding criminal underground. As a homecoming present for Vito, Joe would use his contacts in that world to arrange for Vito to be discharged from the military, for his injury, by exaggerating its long-term severity and forging the proper documents. His mother and sister would be overjoyed at his permanent return, but Vito would soon learn that they owed $2,000 to a loan shark that Vito's father had borrowed from shortly before his death. I thought I'd never see you again. <laughs> Francesca and me, we wait. Hey, no. sis, what's going and on? We wait for you. Oh. Yeah. So oh. Sit down, sit down. You must be hungry, Vito. Francesca made you a special dinner, zuppa di pollo. It's good for you. Wow, looks good, Frankie. It's a shame your papa didn't live to see this. He would be so proud, Vito. Yeah, sure. Vito, you know better. I'm sorry, Mama, sorry. Benice, signore, pronunciare la propria volontà. Stiamo ricevendo provvedere la propria cucina di mamma. So you have to go back soon? Actually, uh, looks like I won't. Uh, Joe's taking care of it for me. Joe, you want to get into trouble again? Mama, would you rather me go back and get shot again? No. Exactly. No. Joe probably saved my life. Promise that you won't get in any more trouble with that, Joe. You know, your papa used to work for this man at the waterfront named Papa Lardo. He's in the union. You could talk to him, work hard like you were your pup. Talk to him. Please, promise me you go talk to him today. Okay, Mama, okay, I promise. Grazie, Dio. I don't give I'm a sorry. damn. I don't we'll care if you're going to sell hey, everything you got. What the hell's going on here? Vito! You mind your business, no. asshole. Oh, yeah? Yeah? <laughs> To make matters worse, the loan shark was now threatening to raise the debt if it wasn't paid after one more week. Now in desperate need of money and fast, Vito would first turn to Joe, hoping that if anybody knew how to come up with that much money that quickly, it would be him. Best friend or not, Joe would not be able to simply bring Vito in on a high-paying job immediately, so he instead got Vito started by connecting him with a junkyard owner, Mike Bruski, who paid Vito for bringing him stolen vehicles to chop and later sell. Hey, look who's hey, here. Hey, Mikey boy, what's going on? Shit, Mike, you can wash your fucking hands once in a while. Now I need a fucking bet. Hey, I've been working. Working people occasionally get dirty, you know. Besides, I just wiped them off. 
With what? The same fucking rag you used to clean the toilet, you filthy fuck? Put a lid on it. What, what are you, from the health department, or you want to do some business? <laughs> business, of course. This here's my friend Vito. Vito, this is Mike Bruski. But don't shake his hand. I ain't got that much soap at home. Nice to meet you, Vito. Hey, uh, me and Vito go way back. He just come back from overseas and he needs some cash. So I figure he can help with your uh, supply problem. I can vouch for him. Uh-huh. Okay. Joe told you about our side business, right? Yeah. I only want regular cars, nothing fancy. You get a cut of every car. I take as many as I can handle. And don't bring no cops around, okay? They follow you here. I don't know your ass from Jesus. You get me? Got it. God damn it, Mike! You put your grubby mitts on my fucking coat. I paid a fortune for this thing. All right, calm down or I'll stick them up your ass, you sissy. You know, dry cleaning costs Jesus these days. Christ. Plenty. And who knows if they can even get this filled out. You shut up. Vader, listen to me. I need a Walter Coop today. I got a few people looking for parts, but I can't find a car. Because you don't know where to look. Every time I drive down Hunters, I see one parked by a bar there. I think the place is called the Lone Star. Isn't that a Moulinyan neighborhood? I'll stick out like a sore thumb. All right, look, I'll give you 350 bucks for it. It's worth the risk, right? 400. <laughs> All right, deal. Avito, come on, let's go. Andiamo. Meantime, I'll be sending you the cleaning bill for my coat. Yeah, I'll change my address, you rat prick. Okay, listen up. This is your maiden voyage, so to speak. So try not to fuck it up, eh? Here, Vito, take this, just in case. Hey, nice. It's that cream-colored baby over there. Be careful. Do it quick and get the fuck out of there. Break a window if you have to and go. I'll wait for you back at Mike's. Hey, what if I run into problems? Then you deal with them. Look, consider this a test. If you fail, I hear the hiring down at the factory. Right, just asking. Good luck, pal. I see you back at Mike's. In addition to working for Mike, Vito would also introduce himself at his mother's request to his father's former employer down at the dock union, Federico Fat Derek Papalardo. Derek would initially humor Vito with a standard backbreaking labor job, but needing money a lot faster than such work would ever pay, he would eventually talk himself into collecting a barber's fee from Derek's other workers, something that was likely done to Vito's own father many times. Close the door. It's windy. What do you want? Uh, yeah, I'm looking for a Mr. Papalotto. Oh, yeah? Why? My name's Vito Scaletta. My old man used to work for him, and I'm looking for a job, so I came here. Well, you're in the right spot, sonny boy. Federico Papayato at your service. You can call me Derek. I think I remember your dad. Good guy, but drank like a fish. What's he up to these days? He's dead. Oh, well, y'all gotta go sometime. Right, Steve? Sure, Derek. So you need a job, huh? Well, you're in luck. We just got a new shipment to unload. Steve will show you around. Now scram, my steak's getting cold. Despite the perhaps uncomfortable implications of this, Vito would take to the task very naturally and make a cool, easy $100, but he was going to need a lot more to make $2,000 by the end of the week. But Joe did have one good job up his sleeve. Joe would introduce Vito to one Henry Tomasino, a soldado or soldier for the Clemente crime family one of the three families who ran organized crime in Empire Bay. Due to an ongoing gas shortage in the United States due to the state of the war, Henry had seen an opportunity to steal and resell gas stamps at a ridiculous premium, which Vito was going to help with. I need gas stamps. They're worth the fortune now because of the gas shortage. Where can we get them? In the Office of Price Administration. Uh, that's a federal government agency. Isn't that a little risky? What? Too much for you. No, no, no. Just trying to think of how we can pull it off. Ah, it can't be that hard. The stamps are kept in the safe at night, but the keys are probably around here somewhere. You got somebody inside? Yeah, one of our guys. His sister works there. Can she help us out? Ask her yourself. Her name's Maria Agnello. Here's the address. Tell her I say you. 
All right, what about the safe? What if the keys aren't there? That's your problem. But what's the job pay? I'll give you 600 bucks for 10,000 gallons worth of stamps. Okay, we're in. No, no, I need Vito to do this alone. I got another job for you, Joe. So? What do you say, Vito? Yeah, sure. Hey, and don't forget to take a piece with you. You never know what's gonna happen. Better to be safe than sorry. I got be. Wait, wait, wait. This isn't some liquor store stick-up. I want this to be a clean job. If you kill anybody, your cut drops to a third. Gabish? Yeah, I got it. No problem. Okay, when you're done, you come back here and we'll settle up. All right, I'll see Good you. Good luck, Vito. Using an inside man, or woman in this case, Maria Agnello, Vito would break into the office of Price Administration and obtain the gas stamps. But upon returning to Henry, learned that they were all set to expire the next morning, forcing Vito to spend the rest of the night running across the city selling the stamps to every gas station attendant he could find. The next day, Vito and Joe would once again meet Henry and be given another, more important job. This time one that was directly requested by a higher ranking member of the family, unlike the gas stamps job which had been Henry's personal score. A man who borrowed money from the Clementi family to open his jewelry store wasn't paying his debt back fast enough, and so Luca Garino tasked Henry with robbing the place, but the actual work would be done by Joe and Vito, this time together. What the hell is this? Come on, boys. The cops will be here any minute. Move it! Ryan fucking O'Neill? What the fuck is this? You crazy bastard, what the fuck are you doing? Barbaro, what the hell are you doing here, you fuck? <laughs> You're a little late, Chief. There's nothing left here fuck for you. Fuck off, fatso. This is our heist. You want to get out of here in one piece, you'd better hand yeah, over yeah, everything yeah. you've well, got. Well, the sign outside didn't say Brian O'Neill's place. If it did, I wouldn't have robbed it. Instead, I would have set it on fire. reported at the West Side Mall. Repeat, 1031. Burglary this in progress. This is car 54. We're on it. But I suggest you get lost before the cops show up. Ah, fuck! Kiss my the ass. fuck out of here. <laughs> Get your ass over here! You waiting for a formal fucking invitation? Over there! Shoot! Shit! Jesus, be careful! Almost lost it. Yeah, I think I just shit myself. Where'd they go? They must have gone this way, Sarge. Oh, fuck that! I don't get paid enough for this. Fuck off, copper! I didn't do nothing! <laughs> 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 Look at the Irish, my ass! <laughs> Who the hell was that? Brian O'Neill. Crazy Mick Bastard. Not too bright. Usually works his hired muscle. <sighs> yeah, I didn't think he was the brains of the operation. Shit, the cops! Come on, get out of the light! Let's go! Come on, come on, come on! Don't worry. Give me a bag. I'll go ditch the goods. Alright, pal. Meet you back home. Try not to get pinched on the way there. Almost as soon as the robbery began, however, it would go south, or rather north, with the arrival of Brian O'Neill's Irish gang looking to pull off the exact same score, the exact same night, at the exact same time. Vito and Joe would manage to use the Irish's brazen arrival to mask their own escape, though, eventually making it out unscathed by bullets or the law this time, and being one step closer to paying off his late father's debt. A couple weeks later, Joe and Vito would be formally introduced to the man who'd commissioned the jewelry store robbery, Luca Garino, and be given another job on top of a seemingly lucrative proposition to join the Clementi crime family after paying the $5,000 initiation fee. Before that, though, Joe, Vito, and Henry were going to ambush a former Clementi crime family associate named Sidney Penn, who was refusing to share the profits of his distillery with Mr. Clementi and had threatened to use evidence he had against the family if they tried to convince him otherwise. Not being one for subtlety, Henry's plan involved purchasing an MG-42 machine gun from another war vet, Henry Marsden, and setting it up across the street from Penn's distillery, where Henry had specifically purchased an apartment to watch the place and plan the attack. Where are you from, Henry? Sicily. What brought you to the States? Mussolini. Uh, we buy a ticket. Don't be a smart ass, Joe. My father was a. Uh, a man of honor. 
and things got pretty bad for us after Mussolini came into power. My old man figured I'd either get drafted or locked up, so he sent me to America and got me a job working for Pimenti. So what happened to your father? He said he was too old to make the trip. Mussolini had him arrested, and they died in jail. They won't even turn his body over for a proper burial. That's rough. So how's your English so good? They're coming. Those black cars. Vito, aim for the fat bastard. We gotta nail him before he gets in the building. Get ready. All right, I'm on it. They got All guns. right, showtime. They got guns up there in that window. <laughs> Don't kill me. Please, I got a wife. You should have thought about your wife before. I'm doing it in your wife. Just don't kill me. Oh, for Christ's sake. Don Clemente sends his regards. Oh. Fuck. Fuck you. Sorry, you. Henry, you okay? Right. Where'd he hit you? Of course I'm not fucking okay. He shot me in the fucking leg. Oh, God. oh yeah, it's bleeding all Son over. Son of a place. Get me to El Greco. The fucking painter? No, the fucking doctor. Okay, okay, you take idiot. it easy. We're gonna get you there in a minute. The Greek guy lives up in High Brook. Right, let's get you to the oh, car. Oh, oh, you're heavier than you look. Although the ambush itself would mostly go to plan, it would nearly end in tragedy for Henry when the three men cornered Penn and he managed to pull his pistol on Henry just before being executed. Vito and Joe would take Henry to the mob doctor El Greco, and Henry would pay Vito $2,000 for the job, enough to fully pay off his family's debt and earning him a great deal more respect and reputation in his other family. Thanks for everything. Hope you'll be okay. Yeah, me too. I'll stay here with Henry. Meet me at my place. <clears throat> All right. Vito, hey, how you doing? Shh, no, 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 no. I just wanted to give you the money to pay off Papa's debt. Oh, Vito, that's great. I was gonna try and see if we could pay it back in installments. I got a little money. He wouldn't have hurt us. Don't be so sure, but it doesn't matter now. Here, take Where'd it. you get all this money, Vito? You haven't done nothing you'll be sorry for, have hey, you? Don't worry. Everything's fine. Thank you, Vito. Thank no you. No problem. All right, look, I better be going. I, I don't want Ma to see me. She'll be asking where I got the money, too. Don't worry. I'll make something up. All right. Give her a big kiss for I me, will. okay? Take care of yourself, Vito. Vito Scaletta? Yeah? What's it to you? You're under arrest for the illegal distribution of federal ration stamps. You're coming with us. One of the gas station attendants ratted me out. The guy fingered me and they strung on Mama into telling him where I was staying. But they had no idea who I was working for and I wasn't about to tell them. But only two weeks after beginning his work for the mob, Vito Scaletta's luck would run out when on February 26, 1945, he was arrested outside of Joe's apartment for the illegal distribution of gas stamps. As it turned out, one of the gas station attendants he sold the stamps to ratted him out to the police, who were then able to track him down to Joe's through his mother. Though the Clementi family, through Luca Garino, would hire a lawyer for Vito's defense, he would really only be there to ensure Vito didn't say anything about anyone else involved in the robbery. And just three months after his arrest, Vito would be handed a 10-year prison sentence at Hartman Federal Penitentiary. However, life inside for a man like Vito wouldn't be nearly as bad as he imagined, thanks once again to his good buddy Joe. Joe would advise Vito to meet with another man on the inside, Leo Galante, the consigliere for the Vinci crime family. And by sheer coincidence, Vito would run into the man after striking up a fight with an old rival who was also now in prison, Brian O'Neill. After three action-packed days of staring at the wall, I got a message from Joe to contact a guy named Leo Galante, who could supposedly help me out in here. 
This wasn't the kind of place where you could survive on your own. I know you. You're that fucking guinea who was with Bobo in a jewelry store. I'm in this fucking hellhole because of you. You got locked up because you're a stupid, crazy fuck. <laughs> you know, fellas, my mom was right. There is a god! <laughs> and he sent you here, you guinea bastard. So that I could pay you back! This looks interesting. Wanna make a small bet? Step back! Okay, Did you hear me? Break it Get out of here! Both of you are going to hold! We're gonna give you a little time to think about what you've done. Close it up. So O'Neill almost took my head off, but I made a stand. And let me tell you something, when you're inside, it counts for a lot more than you might think. How long are you planning on keeping him in here? Long enough to learn his lesson. That's gonna have to change. He in any shape to fight. Should be. Boys didn't knock him around too bad after the brawl in the yard. All right, open it up. Rise and shine, Skeletta. You got yourself a visitor. My name is Leo Galante. I heard you wanted to speak to me. Yeah. Uh, one of Clemente's guys said I should contact you. Said maybe you could help me out. Oh, fuck Clemente. I don't provide protection for his guys in here. But I saw how you handled that Mick who's after you, O'Neill. He could prove useful. Come with me, boy. Now listen up, fellas. This is Vito. He's gonna be helping us out. Peppy here's got a big fight coming up. Against O'Neill. He needs a sparring partner. When I saw of you out there in the yard, you're just the man for the job. You're gonna help us out, kid. In return, you'll be under my protection. And who knows, maybe you'll even learn a thing or two along the way. I guess I can't say no to that offer, huh? I don't remember asking. All right, fellas. Let's get this show on the road. After impressing Galante with his fighting abilities, he would be recruited to serve as a sparring partner for Pepe Costa and in return be placed under Galante's personal protection for the duration of his sentence. Vito would end up spending most of his time inside training, fighting, and even fighting off an attempted assault in the showers, but he would also occasionally receive visits from his sister Francesca to keep his spirits up. Hi, Vito. Hey, Frankie. How you doing? I'm doing good. Real good. Thanks. So, uh, how's things? Well, I, I got something to tell you. I'm getting married, Vito. Oh, Maron, that's great. I mean, it would have been nice if he asked my permission first, but... Hey, I'm happy for you. Vito, you're in jail. Look at yourself. Uh, how'd you let this happen? Hey, I already got a lecture from the judge, huh? I don't need another one. Just... Just drop it, alright? Vito, there's something else. It's Mama. What do you mean? What about her? She's sick, Vito. She's been like this for weeks, and she's not getting any better. Look, Frankie. Go to Joe's. He's holding on to my money for me. You get her the best doctor you can find. And, uh... You keep the rest as a wedding gift. Vito... No, no, I mean it. Looks like I'm not gonna need it for a while. All right, looks like I gotta go. Uh, look, you take care of Ma. Tell her I love her. I will. And thanks, Vito. Bye. On one visit in June of 1945, Vito would learn that Frankie was due to get married, to which Vito offered his money, being held by Joe, to help pay for the wedding. He would also learn that day, though, that his mother had fallen ill, and only a week later he would hear of her death, and all the money he had would instead go straight towards the funeral. No, 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 no! Fuck! 
Mama died while Francesca was visiting me. Instead of going toward a good doctor and a wedding gift, every penny I had went to the funeral. Vito would spend the next six years behind bars and eventually settle his dispute with Brian O'Neill by cutting his throat. And despite this, thanks to his newfound connections, he would be released four years early in April of 1951. Now armed with a lot more knowledge of how the organized crime world actually operated and ready to try again. It all worked out just fine. They never found out who did it. Leo arranged for me to relocate to his cell. Well, actually, it was more like a suite. Life was getting better by the minute. So, Vito, what do you plan on doing when you get out of this shithole? I don't know. I sure as hell ain't gonna go back to work on for Clemente, I can tell you that. Yeah, you're better off just forgetting about that old bastard. Trust me, Alberto's a real cocksucker, and you can bet that lawyer he's hired was just there to make sure you didn't rot. But don't worry. You'll get his. Letting guys into your family for money like he offered you is against the rules. He's gonna have a lot of explaining to do. To who? I thought Clemente was the boss. You obviously don't know how things work around here. You see, there's more than one family in Empire Bay. There's three. Each family controls their own neighborhoods. There's a system of rules. And if there's any disagreements, the bosses of all the families meet to work things out. That's the commission. Great, so what do I do now? Am I in trouble too? No, 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 no. nothing like that. You're young, you're smart, and you've proven you can keep your mouth shut. You're exactly the type of guy everybody wants working for him. Yeah, but I don't even know who these other guys are. There's two other bosses besides Clemente. One is Carlo Falcone. The other is Frank Vinci. Carlo is young and ambitious. Yeah, the guy's a freaking nut job. He's new blood, whereas Don Vinci is a man of honor. He respects the old ways. You know these guys? <laughs> you could say that. And Frank Vinci is consigliere. You think being just a regular old man gets you all this? But listen, Vito, I'm getting out in a few months. When I do, you'll see what we can do about adjusting your sentence. Pepe, come here. Have a taste. Galante wasn't lying. He called in a few favors and arranged for me to get out early. Knocked almost four years off my sentence. Now, Joe used to come visit me and, you know, kind of fill me in on what was happening on the outside. But I tell you, as soon as I walked out of that prison gate, it was like a whole new world. Vito! Hey, you break out of jail? Ah, oh, jeez. Good to see you in regular clothes and on the right side of the bars again. Welcome home. Come on in, come in, come in. Man, I tell you, lots changed since I went away. Yeah, I guess it has. And hey, it ain't much, but I hooked you up with a nice little apartment, just like you Thanks. said. Now I got a surprise for you. We're going out tonight to celebrate, and I'm going to introduce you to somebody. Yeah, sounds good to me. You're going to need a little cash so you can get things going again. I got a piece for you, too, if you want it. Ah, here. Always comes in handy. So, uh, what do you want to do now that you're a free man? Hey, what do you think? I want to go back to working with you again. All right. I was worried they might have turned you straight nah. in there. <laughs> I actually met a lot of people and learned a lot while I was on the inside. Got a much better idea of how things work now. Good thing, because I wasn't exactly sitting around on my ass while you was in there. Don't worry, though. I'll show you the ropes, like always. All right. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go. Jesus, I didn't expect you to be raring to go like this, but what the hell? Come on, let's go see your new place. Jeez, I thought you was going to be a no-show. Not bad. Nice material. Thanks. So, uh, what's the plan for tonight? You'll find out. A friend of mine's coming to pick us up. I met him when you was on your little vacation. And show him some respect. He's kind of an important guy. Oh, yeah? You'll see in a minute. Here he comes. Hey, Joe. Hey, Eddie. Here I How's am. it going? Man, not too bad. Not too bad. Oh, this your buddy? Yeah. This is my pal Vito. Vito, 
This here is a good friend of mine, Eddie Scarpa. Nice to meet you, Eddie. Same here, Vito. Okay, fellas, I'm dying for a drink. Let's go. Vito's second return home in a decade would initially begin well, with Joe getting Vito a new apartment and introducing Vito to Falcone family underboss Eddie Scarpa, and the three heading out for a night of wine and women. After a long night of partying, however, Vito and Joe would notice a foul odor emanating from the back of Eddie's car on the drive home, and Eddie would reveal that it was in fact the dead body of FBI agent Frankie Potts, who had been investigating organized crime in Empire Bay. Though Eddie had intended to dispose of Potts earlier, he'd gotten drunk with Vito and Joe instead, and by then both he and Joe were far too drunk to actually finish the job, leading to Vito spending his first night free in six years burying a body in the middle of the night. <clears throat> ah, oh, fucking Christ almighty! How long this guy been in here, Eddie? Uh, just a couple days. You're gonna have to get him out of there, Vito. Oh, that's just great. I can't handle the smell. Some fucking welcome home this is. Hey, mother. Hey, hey, here's a hole. Right here. Dump him in. <laughs> Finally done. <sighs> okay. Now who's gonna bury him? What? I, I give me a minute to get a hold of myself. Can you just do it? Every time I get a whiff of the guy, it makes me have to puke. And Eddie's not gonna be any oh, help here. Fine, either. whatever. Hey, fellas, how about a little music, eh? You gotta be kidding me. Good night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to This go. wasn't supposed to be da, part da, of your homecoming da, da, party, but it's night, nice out here, ain't it? Well, I ain't been in the woods for a while. Yeah, you won't be liking it so damn much after I smack you with this shovel. The next day, Vito would return to his usual work with Joe and be reintroduced to an old friend of his, who he'd recently begun giving small opportunities to, Marty Santarelli. Joe and Vito would spend the day illegally selling cigarettes out of the back of a truck owned by Eddie, although they would even sell a few cartons to the occasional police officer themselves. Towards the end of the day, though, the two men would be accosted by members of a greaser gang led by Billy Barnes, and in the chaos, Eddie's truck would be completely destroyed, leaving the underboss more than a little upset. I'll make you a deal. You fuck over ten cartons and maybe we'll let you and your buddy get out of here in one piece. Hey look, pal. How about you get back in your cute little car with your little friends there and I'll pretend I never seen you. Sound good? <laughs> you don't get it, do you, you fat motherfucker? This is our turf, and it's gonna cost you to operate here. Now pay up! You're the one who doesn't get it. You have any idea who you're talking to? One last chance. You walk away now and- Yeah, I'll tell you who I'm talking to. A fat two-bit fucking Dago door-to-door -door salesman hocking stolen cigarettes on my turf. And it's time to close up shop, asshole. Okay, boys. I think it's time for a fire sale. Shit. Joe! Oh, fuck. <laughs> what do you say now, Porky? What do I gotta say? That's what I gotta say. Come on, hop in that car and let's go. Now needing to pay back Eddie for the truck, Joe and Vito would also be tasked with meeting Derek Papalardo's second-in-command at the Dock Union and Vinci family enforcer Steve Coyne down at the Crazy Horse to teach the greasers not to mess with the Mafia. Hey, how'd you get in here? Followed the fucking yellow brick road. Next. Ha, <laughs> nice one. You fuckers are dead. Joe, watch out! Uh, thanks, kid. Shit, they got guns! Let them have it! After obliterating the greasers at their hideout, Joe and Vito would sell two of their expensive hot rods in order to pay back Eddie for the loss of his truck, even managing to walk away with a small payment for all of their troubles. A couple months later, in May of 51, Eddie would introduce Vito to the boss of the Falcone crime family, Carlo Falcone, 
and be given an opportunity to get back at Luca Garino for attempting to make Vito pay a fee to join the Clementi family, something that was certainly not standard. So Vito, how do you feel about Alberto Clemente and Luca Garino? Well, honestly, Mr. Falcone, the way I see it, those assholes tried to steal 5,000 bucks from me and then left me to rot in jail. That's good, because the two of them are planning to make a move on us. So it looks like we're going to have to do something before they do something. Eddie will tell you the rest. I'm sure you won't let me down. Goodbye, Mr. Falcone. Nice to meet you, Vito. So what the hell's going on? A car with three of our guys in it disappeared last night, and word around town is that Luca might have had something to do with it. Who's missing? Harvey Beans and the two guys who were supposed to be protecting him, Tony Balls and Frankie the mm -hmm. Mick. Yeah. Beans is Carlo's accountant. If he talks, we're all fucked. What do you need me to do? I need you to wait for him in front of Freddy's and follow him to find out if he's involved. And then? If you find out that he had anything to do with this, you whack the bastard. And if any of our guys is still alive, try and rescue them. Hopefully you can find them before they spill the beans about our operation. Where do you think he'll go? I got no idea. So go prepared. Make sure you've got a fast car and some firepower. All right, no problem. Okay, stop by here when you're done. And Vito, don't tell nobody about this. Got it. Carlo believed that Luca was about to make a move on him, and intended to strike first before he got the chance. The night before, three important Falcone family associates had gone missing. Harvey Beans Epstein, the family's accountant, Frankie the Mick, and Antonio Balsamo, aka Tony Balls, and word on the street was Luca had something to do with it. Vito would tail Luca to the Clementi slaughterhouse and sneak in through the building's sewage system, eventually reaching the area where the three men were being held, only to find Frankie the Mick already dead, and Luca's men about to start in on Balls and Beans. Ah, hey, what's that fucking stench? Oh. Hey! Hey, somebody's Drop over there! Him. Hey, who the fuck are you supposed to be? Jesus Christ, what, what, is Captain Shitbag here to save the day? Shut the fuck up, Luca. Hey, I know you. You're the chump who was hanging around with that moron, Barbaro. I thought you were still rotting in the can. What the fuck you think you're doing here? Falcone sent me. He isn't too fond of skinny little cocksuckers trying to turn his guys into mincemeat. So, you joined up with Falcone, huh? Well, I'll tell you what. If you knew what was really going on, you'd realize that you was better off in jail. But that don't matter now, anyway. Vito would be knocked out and strung up alongside Epstein and Balsamo, but fairly quickly managed to escape and turn the tides on his kidnappers, and together with Balsamo, corner Luca in a warehouse office, eventually taking out all of Luca's backup together and leaving Luca's ultimate fate in Tony's hands. <coughs> Fucking smart, huh? Go ahead, try. Son of a bitch. What's he doing over there? Come on, shit! Yeah, go! Oh, Come here, you fuck. Leave me alone! Leave me alone, now you I'll fucking bastard! I'll show you what it feels no, like wait, you know. No, no, God, wait. fucking son of a bitch. I'm gonna have a little fun with Luca before I grind him up. Wanna join me? Uh, thanks for the invitation, but I think I'll pass it. Same blood, huh? No, just hate the sight of Luca. I hear you, but you're missing out. I think I'm gonna try out that cattle prod he was yapping about. Uh, yeah, Eddie wanted me to take care of him personally. Don't worry about that. It'll just take a little longer this way. This fuck don't deserve a quick death. I can't argue with that. Okay, I'm gonna go. I stink like an outhouse. I gotta get cleaned up. And tell Lady he don't gotta worry about Luca. Yo, Beans, open the door. It's all over. 
You... You're still alive? Yeah. What'd you expect? Look, before we go home, you want to give me a hand with Sleeping Beauty here? You know, that's not such a bad idea. After returning to Eddie to give the good news of a job well done and nearly ruining everyone's appetite at the Falcone family's main front restaurant, the Maltese Falcon, Vito would be instructed to return home and put on a nice suit and come back to the restaurant, but what happened next, neither he or Joe were truly expecting. The two men would be formally brought into the Falcone crime family as made men, receiving the respect that such an honor brought among thieves. Just do as you're told, okay? Joe, come on in. Hey. Good luck. All right, your turn, Vito. Gentlemen, this is Vito Scaletta. Vito. Know that this family of ours is a secret. You are entering the Society of the Chosen. A society which does not exist to the rest of the world. Our family means more to you from now on than your own family. Or God, or your country. If I ask you to kill your own brother, you must do it. Show me which finger would pull the trigger. Repeat after me, Vito. If I were to betray the secret of our way of life... If I were to betray the secret of our way of life... May my soul burn in hell, just like this saint. May my soul burn in hell, just like this saint. Amico Nostra. Gentlemen, I give you our new friend, Vito Scaletta. I am very pleased to have these two talented and honest men join us. And I'm happy this has happened in the presence of our esteemed guests, especially Don Frank Vinci. And it's You might wonder why I'd take this risk again after spending almost seven years in a can. You see, where I grew up, the only guys who mattered were the guys who had the balls to take what they wanted. You will receive payment for your services from Eddie. Would you like to add anything, Frank? Whatever you do, gentlemen, stay away from the dope. No dope. That's our policy. You can make plenty of money. And after years of doing everybody else's dirty work, too many risks. I was willing to risk anything to finally be somebody. Later that year, in June, Eddie, Vito, Joe, and Carlo Falcone would meet to discuss their next steps, given the escalating situation. After kidnapping and torturing Falcone's men, Clementi put the two families at war, and now anything Carlo did in retaliation could be justified before the commission, the meetings of the three controlling families, and Alberto Clementi knew this. Good morning, Mr. Falcone. Hi, Vito. Take a seat. Hey, guys. <sighs> so what's happening? I heard how you got rid of Luca, Vito. Good job. Thanks to you, we now have proof that Clemente was behind the attack on our guys. We couldn't do anything to him openly till now. He just cut his own throat. He kidnapped and tortured our guys, and that means war. Anything we do now, I'm going to be able to justify before the commission. Alberto knows this, so he's going to act quickly and try and come after us first. So we're going to take out Clemente. Exactly. Turns out Clemente called a big meeting in the Empire Arms Hotel today. 
This is our best chance to get rid of him and his top guys. Oh, sure, yeah. We'll just waltz right in there and kill a few dozen heavily armed men in broad daylight in the nicest hotel in town. Is that about right? Don't worry. I got a plan. Shit! Joe, put that thing away. Eddie, don't worry. It's safe. I just gotta For press Christ's this. Sake, put it away now. Okay. What's the matter with you? Okay. You're such a chicken shit. Okay, okay. So now we're gonna waltz right in and blow up the nicest hotel in town. Isn't that overkill? Don't worry. This thing ain't that powerful. It won't blow up the whole building, but everybody in the room where it goes off is dead meat. How are we gonna know when to detonate it? We'll use a window washing platform. We'll almost be able to watch it explode. Since when are you the smart one? Okay, fellas. I'm counting on you. If all goes well, I'll have something nice for you. When it's over, call Eddie at this number. Oh, by the way, I closed the bar today, just in case Alberto tried something. Hey, good luck, fellas. Hey, what about that kid in the hallway? You mean Marty? Uh, he ain't part of the organization, so he had to wait outside. I mean, why is he here at all? Why do you think? He's going with us because we need a getaway driver and somebody to cover our asses. What do you got against him anyway? I known him since he was a little kid, and he saved my ass with them greases. Yeah, but we're not fighting a bunch of drunk dirtbags this time. We're about to take out the most powerful family in this city, and you're bringing a kid. And how old were you when you started doing this shit? You're talking like you're some old fart. Look, Vito, he's gonna wait in the car outside and drive us away. That's it. He ain't even gonna know what we're doing there. He's a great driver, and that's exactly what we need on this one. Okay, Joe, whatever. But I'm telling you right now, this is a bad idea. Clementi would call a big meeting of all of his high-ranking lieutenants at the Empire Arms Hotel, and Carlo would see it as a perfect opportunity to get rid of Alberto once and for all. Vito and Joe, driven by Joe's young friend Marty, would sneak into the hotel by disguising themselves as janitors, with Marty waiting in the garage as their getaway. Using a paid-off staff member of the hotel, Joe and Vito would make their way up to Clementi's floor, spotting Henry Tomasino for the first time since Vito's prison sentence, and though both would recognize each other, neither would say a thing. Joe and Vito would plant bombs inside Alberto's conference room, and then head to the roof, where they murdered several Clementi soldiers in order to reach the window washing platform, and then descend and connect the wires to the detonator in order to trigger the explosion. Just like clockwork. <laughs> ah, here we go. These assholes ain't gonna go. Oh, 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 I swear, you're like a half a retard sometimes. Ah, what the? Shit. Christ, I almost pissed on my fucking shoes what in here. What a fucking mess. Felt like a fucking earth, but what the fuck? Oh shit! Lucky bastard. You assholes! You're gonna fuck die for this! Get away! Come on, Fido! Amazingly, the only person not in the room when the bomb went off was Alberto Clemente, forcing Joe and Vito to fight their way down through the hotel and dozens of Clemente's soldiers to eventually find Marty murdered in the parking garage by Clemente's men. Horribly distraught, Joe and Vito would chase down Clemente and a furious Joe would finally put the monster in the ground. Vito would bring Joe back to his apartment, but instead of a celebration for a job well done, Joe would be unable to do anything but grieve. That's the end of him. Can't be sure unless we check.
That night, Joe would go on a drunken rampage at the Lone Star Bar, eventually driving away all of the bar's traffic by waving a gun around and erratically mourning the loss of his friend, whom he had brought along for the job. In Joe's grief, he would accidentally kill a bartender, Leon, whom Vito would dispose of discreetly to keep Joe out of further trouble. A month later, after the effective destruction of the entire Clementi family, Vito would be approached by none other than Henry Tomasino, looking to use his history with Vito to start working for the Falcones now that Clementi was out of the picture. Vito would gladly introduce Henry to Eddie, who almost immediately tasked Henry with proving his loyalties to Carlo Falcone, by murdering another man who Carlo now suspected was planning to make a move against him, the Vinci family consigliere, Leo Galante. Unable to object in the moment, Vito would leave the Maltese Falcon and rush to beat Henry to Leo's residence in Highbrook, in order to warn his friend of the impending assassination, despite the implications for himself. Leo! Leo, you here? How the hell did you get in here? Get out of here! Oh, shove Leo, this Leo, gun up put here. it away! It's me, Vito! Vito? What the hell are you doing here? You could have called Leo, us. there's no time to talk. You gotta get out of here. Quick, they're after you. What? Come upstairs, Vito. My feet are getting cold. You want a drink? Oh, I want a drink. What the fuck is wrong with Okay, you? so what's happening? Look, Falcone wants you dead. The guys are on their way. You gotta get out what? of here. Why the hell would I do that? Look, Falcone heard Vinci's planning to make a move on him because Clementi lied and said he was in the dope business. Lied? Vito, Carlo Falcone is in the dope business. Everybody knows that. Clemente tried to muscle his way into the business, so Falcone got rid of him. Now he wants to get rid of us, too, before we make a move on him. How do you know all this? I got my sources. Why did you come here again? Why? What, what are you getting senile on me? Because they're gonna kill you! Stop talking, for Christ's sake! Get dressed and let's go! Why don't we just get rid of whoever Carlos sent to whack me? We got the advantage? They don't know we're expecting I can't do that. I know the guy. I'm actually the one who got him the job. Huh? You hired your friend to whack me? No, not exactly. Look, I don't have time to explain. He's gonna be here any minute. Okay, wait here. I'll get dressed. Shit, too late. They're here. Oh shit, Henry can't see me here. We gotta hide. Quick, before he comes up here. Take a seat. What the hell is going on here? Look, Henry, Leo's a friend of mine, all right? He helped me out when I was in prison. He pretty much saved my life. And he's the reason I got made. Look, I didn't know Eddie was going to put a contract out on him. I had to warn him. You got to understand. Yeah, but you got to understand that I can't afford to screw this up. If I let Leo go, Falcone will think I fucked him on purpose and I'll have me killed. Damn it, Henry. I'm your friend here. I do the same thing for you and you know it. This has nothing to do with friendship, Vito. This is business. And if I screw up, I'm done. I can't let him go. I took a contract and I got to finish the job. If you don't want to watch, you can leave. And don't worry about me. I won't tell anybody you were here. Look, Leo told me that all of this is because Falcone's into drugs. He's breaking the rules and he wants to get rid of anybody who knows about it. So what? The only people who aren't breaking those rules are Frank Vinci and Leo here. And those aren't the people who pay me. Rito, thanks for everything. But leave us now. I've had a long, good life. And it's not worth risking your neck to buy an old man a few more years. No, Leo. There's gotta be a way. Rito. Go. Sorry, Vito. I won't tell anybody you were here. Just make sure nobody sees you leave. This one, pal. What? Hey, kid. Leo. You want a drink? What the hell happened? Your friend and I made a deal. I'm gonna disappear. There's nothing left for me in this town anyway since my wife passed. And I was planning to retire someplace warm anyway. Vito would attempt to escort Leo safely out of his mansion, but be caught by Henry, who, confused by the entire situation, would eventually strike a deal with Leo to keep the aging mobster alive as a favor to Vito. Henry would allow Leo to live and return news of having successfully killed him, but in return, Leo would have to go into hiding for the twilight of his years, a retirement that Leo was seemingly all too happy to get to. 
Later that same day, upon returning home, Vito would find his sister Frankie at his home, distraught at what to do about her increasingly abusive husband, Eric Riley. Vito, being Vito, would promptly track down Riley and give him a beating he wouldn't soon forget, much to Frankie's dismay. But Riley, a member of the same Irish gang that Brian O'Neill had been a part of, now run by Mickey Desmond, would not take the beating without offering something in return. Torch the place! Do it! Now! Born! <laughs> you Dago cunt! Born! <laughs> Late in the night, men would surround Vito's home in Greenfield and set it ablaze with Molotov cocktails. Vito would manage to escape out the window, but the home he'd spent so long waiting to get was now all but gone. He would meet up with Joe to orchestrate his own revenge on Desmond's gang, with Joe and him eventually shooting up their bar in Kingston and Vito killing Desmond himself. With his home, money, and possessions essentially all gone, Vito would initially try to stay with Joe in the interim, but Joe would instead give him the keys to Marty's old apartment, now no longer in use. But for Vito, he only wished he'd had enough money left for a hotel room. In late September of that year, Vito would be approached by Henry with a new proposition. Henry had learned that the real reason Carlo Falcone had Clementi taken out was because Falcone was in the drug business, and Clementi had started to eat into his profits. The only ones that still opposed Carlo's drug stance were Frank Vinci and his consigliere, Leo Galante, which was why Carlo wanted Leo dead as well. As far as Henry was concerned, if Carlo could sell drugs, so could he. So he asked Vito and Joe to join in on him with a deal to buy heroin from the Chinese tongs and then sell it to the distributors to make a hefty profit of $75,000. We can do it. Why can't we? A kilo of heroin costs 2,500 bucks over in France. Then it's another thousand bucks to get it here. And? And we pick up 11 grand for just driving the stuff to the dealers. That's 7,500 bucks profit a mm. kilo. Yeah, but what about Falcone? Carlo won't find out, and even if he does, he'll just threaten us and demand the cut. All right, but if Carlo's the only big supplier in the city, where are you gonna buy the stuff from? I'm way ahead of you. What do you two know about the Tongs? The Chinks? Some kind of organization for Chinese immigrants, right? That's what I said, the Chinks. Right, but it's also a front for their other operations. They run the Chinese quarter, and they keep to themselves. But some of them are interested in doing business with outsiders, and they need middlemen since most people are afraid to deal with them. And we're the middlemen. Yep. They'll give us 10 kilos to start. For how much? 35 grand. And we can sell it for... 110. <whistles> nice. Okay, well, where the hell are we gonna get our hands on 35 grand? I know a loan shark. The hit over on Palisade. I think a loan is 35 if we give him 45 back. Now that means our take is over 20 grand a piece. Not bad for just moving the shit from one place to another. But you know, who's gonna end up using this crap? What do you care? As long as it isn't an outcome. Of course, Vinci was right. Drugs are bad news, they kill people. Look, only idiots do drugs. Deadbeats and losers. If they want to kill themselves so badly, I'd gladly help them out. Especially for 20 grand. I got buyers in the ghetto. They'll take care of the distribution. So we don't need to worry about that. Are you guys in or not? I'm in. Come on, don't be stupid, Vito. 20 fucking grand in one afternoon. <sighs> When? Right now. If we don't take the offer, the Tongs will just find somebody else. Come on, Vito, it'll be a piece of cake. Let's go see Bruno then. Vito, how about you run us all down there? He's on Palisade Street. Okay, let's go. Hi, fellas. We're here to see Bruno. Hiya, Henry. If you got guns on you, Put them down there. I gotta search us. Hiya, Bruno. Hello, Henry. So, to what do I owe the pleasure of your company today? I need 35 grand and 20 dollar bills. Oh, that's a lot of money, Henry. A lot of money, tell me. Why should I give that much to a small-time guy like you, huh? Convince me. I got a short thing. You'll have 45 by the end of the week. What kind of sure thing? Sorry, Bruno. 
That's a trade secret. Then 45 is not enough. I'd be more comfortable with 65. It's a bit steep, even for you. 50 is all I can do. Henry, Henry, I have no guarantee I'll get my money back. And you have nowhere else to go. So, how about 60? Don't think of it as interest. It's more like my cut of the profits. 55, final offer. Anything more than that, it's not worth my time. Deal. I'll give you $35,000 today, and you'll give me $55,000 by Friday. If you don't pay it back by then, the debt goes up by $10,000 every week. You'll get it by Friday. Okay. Isaac, prepare $35,000 and $20 bills. Now, you know I trust you, Henry, but if you screw me, remember these wise words from the Bible. And my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. Exodus, chapter 22, verse 24. <laughs> I'm impressed. You don't seem like the church-going type. Uh, but just remember, the money isn't mine. So even if you get rid of me, that doesn't get rid of your debt. So no funny business, okay, boys? Sure, Bruno. Thank you, Isaac. You want to count it, Henry? I'll take your word for it, and I'll bring it back on Friday along with your cut. I hope so. Good luck, boys. Welcome, Henry. Hello, Mr. Wang. Let us get straight to business. Is your suitcase heavy enough? See for yourself. Hell, Da, this is a bank of 20 yuan Mexican Taipei. It's about 35,000 yuan. All right, take it away and bring the goods. You're a good man, Henry. Here is your merchandise. Each bag contains one kilo. Each kilo weighs a little more than two pounds. Which one do you want to test? Okay, we're good. I'm glad. Next time, we can give you twice the amount. It was a pleasure doing business with you, Mr. Wang. The pleasure was all mine. Knock it off. See how easy that was? Get back in the car. Hello, gentlemen. Fucking set I think up. you have something for us. Drop the suitcases. Hmm. Nice shoes. Wait a minute, these guys ain't cops? Kill the bastard! Shoot me up! First, though, they would need to borrow the money to pay for the initial product, which meant going to a loan shark, one that Vito had unknowingly already dealt with. Henry would bring Joe and Vito to see Bruno Levine, a ruthless moneylender with ties to the commission, and he would demand a far greater compensation than Henry had originally led Vito and Joe to believe was likely. Demanding a return of $55,000 with a threat to increase the debt by $10,000 for every week it isn't paid, the three men would reluctantly agree to the harsher deal and meet with the Tong's enforcer, Se Yun Huang, at the Sea Gift Fishing Company in Chinatown to purchase 10 kilos of heroin. The deal would go smoothly, but as the three left the warehouse, they would be ambushed by what they believed at first to be police officers, but turned out to be rival gangsters from an unknown faction. Joe, Vito, and Henry would be forced to fight their way out of the warehouse courtyard, killing numerous triads and fake police officers in the ensuing chaos, but escaping with the product in hand and prepared to still make good on their initial plan. Two days later, Vito would get a call from Henry, who revealed that somehow Carlo Falcone had found out about their deal, and was now demanding a $60,000 cut, although Vito remained under the impression that Carlo only knew about Henry's involvement and not his or Joe's. 
Their potential profits gone, and now considerably short of the money they would need to pay back Bruno, Henry would ask Joe and Vito to meet him at Lincoln Park, to discuss their options. But upon arriving, they would come upon a scene of true horror. Henry's different these days. The guy's got a real... What the, what the fuck? fuck's going on? <laughs> Shit, that's Henry! <laughs> what the fuck are they hitting him with? Oh, God, get on me! <laughs> fuck! Who the fuck does something like this, Vito? Them people are fucking sick. Shit! Who the fuck does something like this? Who do you think? God damn it, Henry! Damn it, Henry! Damn it, Henry! Look at this, Vito. You fucking believe this? Yeah, the money's gone too. Joe, come on. We gotta get out of here. Cops will take care of Henry. Hey. Hey, that's the old guy who sold us the dope, Wong! After witnessing Henry's brutal murder, Joe and Vito would, against all codes of the organization for which they worked, proceed to storm the Tongs racket at the Red Dragon restaurant, cutting down dozens of Empire Bay triads to reach the man who'd ordered Henry's death, Zeyun Wong. Already knee-deep in the shit, Joe would shoot Wong, much to Vito's frustration, before they could even learn where Henry's money from the heroin deal was, leaving them even further in debt now to Bruno Levine. With Henry now dead, Joe and Vito needed to make $55,000 in a matter of days, and while the prospect seemed unlikely, they weren't about to stop trying until they were dead. They would start by taking a job from Eddie, which was actually a favor for another family out of Lost Heaven, the Salieri family. As detailed in our documentary on the life of Thomas Angelo, the Salieri family had spent years tracking down Mr. Angelo after he'd ratted out his bosses to the authorities, leading to the arrest of the Salieri family boss, Don Ennio Salieri. For more details on the life of Tommy Angelo, see our full episode with the link in the description. It gets us out of bed in the morning. It lets us chase our dreams, even when they're moving too fast to catch. It keeps us from falling over. Oh, we're too tired to take another step. Mr. Angelo? Yes. Mr. Salieri sends his regards. Tommy! Remember that money, jobs, even best pals will come and go. But family, family is forever. Joe and Vito would drive out to Tommy's home in Greenfield and assassinate him, with Vito delivering a specially requested message to Mr. Angelo before Joe shot him dead on his front lawn with a Lupara shotgun. Although they would be compensated quite well for the job, it would be significantly short of the daunting 55000 they still needed, so Vito would next go and see Derek Papalardo down at the Union docks to see if he had any work available. As it turned out, he did, since Frank Vinci had taken all of Derek's regular men as bodyguards for a meeting between all the remaining bosses he was organizing, and now Derek needed help breaking up a labor strike. With Steve Coyne and what few men Derek still had, Vito would head down to break up the strike, but one of the workers would eventually realize who Vito was, the son of Antonio Scaletta, and soon the truth would come out about his death eight years prior. So, what's the problem here, fellas? We want you to give Big John his job back. It's me that decides who gets hired and fired around here, and I say he's fired. All we're asking is for you to hire him back. He's got a family. He 
He needs a job. I've made my decision. See, I told you. Easy does it, Vinny. We want to do this Easy. peacefully. We bust our asses day in and day out for this fat fuck. And if anything ever happens to us, he'll screw us over Blow just like he did Lower your voice now, young man. I don't want to hear another word about that fucking dead. Who are you calling a deadbeat? A crate fell on the poor guy while he was working. For you. Broke both his damn hands. Well, that's his fucking problem, not mine. And I suggest you just get back to work before somebody else's hands get you broke. You goddamn bastard! You fellas are really starting to piss me off. There's no need for violence. Please, put it down. We don't want no trouble. It don't look that way to me. Right now, looks like you got big trouble, don't you? Now, if you all don't want to start looking for new jobs, you'll be back to work in the next ten minutes. You see, Vito, all they do is bitch and moan. Vito? You're Skeletor's boy, ain't you? I, your dad used to talk about you all the time. You look just like him. But what are you doing working for this bastard? After what he did to your old Shut man? Shut your fucking mouth right now. Don't listen to him, Vito. He's full of shit. Come on, let's go. Full of shit, huh? That bastard killed your father, Vito. What? They're just trying to get under your skin, Derek. Hey, stop pointing that gun Why at don't me. Don't you ask him how your dad drowned Trap. that night? We seen him take a walk with Steve. And then Steve come back alone. And all wet. Stop pointing that thing at me. What the hell happened with my father, Derek? Are you nuts or what? Who are you gonna trust, me or these now unemployed losers? We known each other for a long time, Vito. Think of all Why the were things. Were you all wet, Steve? You dive in and try to save him because he wouldn't stay underwater. Keep your mouth shut, Vito. You swore an oath. I was there. Our loyalty to the family is greater than to our own families. Tell that to my mother. Eh, should I kill him? No, not here. We'll settle things with him later. You disappoint me, Vito. You really do. I'm gonna do a hell of a lot more than disappoint you, Derek. Your dad. Not right now. I gotta get that fuck before he runs away. Time to teach that fat fuck a lesson. Vinny, where'd you get that? Doesn't matter. After learning of Steve and Derek's role in his father's death, Vito would go on an absolute rampage, and with aid from the dock workers, managed to catch and kill both men to avenge his father's murder. He would also find a substantial amount of money in Derek's office following the incident, enough to pay back Bruno and keep he and Joe alive, at least a little bit longer. Vito would wait for Joe at his apartment for several hours, but when he failed to return home, Vito would become worried that the worst had already happened. He would again meet with Eddie Scarpa, who was already trying to sort out the mess that Joe and Vito had started, with the tongs, even if he didn't yet know for sure that Vito was responsible. Vito would eventually learn from the locksmith, Giuseppe, that Joe had been abducted by Frank Vinci's men, prompting him to immediately hit the Mona Lisa bar where Vinci's men hung out to get answers. Freeze, and maybe I won't kill you. Hi, fellas. Look at the balls on this guy. Nice to see you too. Don't move a muscle. Come on. Listen to the friendly bartender and stop fucking around, Vito. Now, first of all, I gotta ask you to slowly toss your guns on the floor. No funny business, neither. The bartender's got the itchiest trigger finger in town, huh? I'm not armed. Okay, so what are you doing here, Vito? We wasn't expecting you. I'm looking for Joe Barbaro. I heard some of your guys picked him up. Eh, yeah, maybe. What are you trying to pull? Me and Joe didn't do nothing to you. Mr. Vinci doesn't seem to think so. He wanted a few things explained to him, so that's what Joe is doing. And since you've stopped by, why don't we go and join them? And what if I don't want to? These guns say you do. But don't worry, it's got a hell of a view. Shit. Ah. Oh. Hey, what's up, Joe? The assholes went to take a leak. <sighs> Great. But can you explain to me why the fuck we're here? That old fuck Vinci can't see what's going on right in front of his face. And he thinks I can explain it to him. Idiot. Oh, the happy couple is here already. Welcome, Vito. What's going on? You got no reason to treat us like this. No reason? No reason? First, the business with Leo. And then all hell breaks out in the city. The chinks, they're going nuts. Everybody's fighting like lunatics. And now, those yellow bastards are threatening to kill me. 
It's out of fucking control. Now, I'm too old for this shit, so you're gonna tell me what the hell's going on here. Come on, I'm all ears. Mr. Vinci, look, I don't know what the hell's going on here. Believe me, me and Joe ain't got nothing to do with it. That ain't what I wanna hear. Yeah, well, that's your problem. Because we don't know shit about any of this. That's too bad. Finally. We don't got much time. We gotta do something. All right. We'll try to break the pipe. Come on, help me out. I can't do it by myself. Okay. One, two, three! One, two, three! Again! One, two, three! He would next awaken next to his friend hanging from a series of pipes on the top of a midtown construction site. As though they hadn't already cheated death several times that week though, they would somehow manage to escape this situation and shoot their way down through the construction site and all of Vinci's men trying to stop them. But in the process, Joe would be badly injured. Vito would deliver his friend to the mob doctor El Greco and then immediately return to Bruno to pay off his debt, just barely missing Bruno's men leaving the building to begin searching for Vito themselves. Good evening. You have the money for me? Or do you wish to extend the deadline? Here it is. <laughs> I have to admit, this is somewhat of a surprise. I heard you boys had some... complications. Yeah, we did. I heard that Henry is dead. I'm very sorry to hear that. Isaac, count it. So your little business venture was a success? You got your money, right? Right, right. It's just that the whole city has been turned upside down. The Chinese think the Italians attack them, so they're going after Vinci. That's not good. Not good. Would that have anything to do with the reason you borrowed this money? Sorry, Bruno. That's none of your business. Uh, thank you, Isaac. It looks like the debt is settled. I don't even know your name. Vito. Vito who? Vito Scaletta. Eh, Scaletta. I knew a Scaletta once. But I must say, you're much better at paying back your debts than he was. His poor wife had to do it for him. So it was you who lent my father the money. <laughs> your father. Ah, like father, like son. I see you don't approve. But I didn't make him borrow the money, now did I? Just like I didn't make you. If you ever need a loan, you know where to find me. <laughs> sure. I couldn't sleep. Things were bad. And they were only gonna get worse. The truth was gonna come out sooner or later. And then we were going to have Falcone after us, along with the Chinese and Vinci. This wasn't how I imagined it when we were starting out. I dreamed of money, cars, women, respect, freedom. I guess I ended up getting all that, more or less. But along with it came prison, living in constant fear, and the blood of my friends. I ducked it as long as I could, but it was finally catching up with me. It's all just a matter of time. The next morning, Vito would get a call from Eddie Scarpa pretending as though everything was normal, and asking Vito to meet Carlo personally at the Zaveski Observatory. On his way though, he would be stopped by several armed men and forced into a vehicle with the boss of the Empire Bay Triads, Mr. Chu, and another than his old mentor, Leo Galante. Leo would offer Vito an ultimatum, kill Carlo Falcone to finally put his feuds to rest, or be killed himself alongside Joe. Not really having much of a choice, Vito would agree and make his way to the observatory to meet with Carlo, who was likely also planning to have Vito killed himself. But Vito was no ordinary mobster. He was one of the best of his era, not to mention an actual army trained soldier, and he would subsequently cut through dozens of Falcone's men to eventually reach Carlo himself and get his chance to finally end things once and for all.
Wow, look who it is. This is who they send? This is an insult. What'd they tell you, Vito? Take care of me and all's forgiven? You really think they're just gonna let you walk after everything you did? Then again, chumps like you never do think about the big picture. But your buddy Joe understands, don't you, Joe? What the fuck is this? I could ask you the same question. Loyalty's a funny thing, huh, Vito? No such thing as friendship in this business. Didn't your old pal Leo teach you that while you're sucking his cock back in the can? <laughs> you're just a fucking pawn, Vito. It's all you ever were. When are you gonna realize Joe, that? you just gotta trust me. You think I give a shit about the feds? All those tired old fucks on the commission? They're using you, Vito. Just like Clemente used you. Just like I used you. Just like that rat fuck Henry used you. You vouch for that piece of shit. Brought him into my house. And now, you dumb fuck, you're gonna pay for it. Now, Joe. Hey. If you're gonna pull that trigger, do it already. What are you waiting for? Vito. Let's shoot this cocksucker. Remember what we talked about, tree. Joe. You're gonna throw all that away? Do it! Two. Now! You know something, Carlo? For the last ten years, all I'd done was kill. I killed for my country. Ah! I killed for my family. Ah! I killed anybody that got in my way. Oh! But this one... This one's for me. Fuck. <laughs> Fucking prick. What the hell is this? It's all right, Joe. Is it done? It's done. All right, then. Looks like a celebration is in order. Come on. Let's head to the cat house. Sounds good to me. Come with me, Vito. There's more we need to talk about. Joe and Vito would proceed to cut down all of Carlo's men, and Vito would get the opportunity to put down the dawn of the Falcone crime family himself. With his obligation fulfilled, Vito and Joe would leave the observatory to meet with Leo Galante and the rest of Vinci's men outside. But there was still one more catch that Vito had not yet anticipated. Hey, 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 what the hell's going on? Where are they taking Joe? Sorry, kid. Joe wasn't part of our deal. Pleasure as always, sir. Two more glasses. <laughs> Lincoln. Good to see you. This is Vito Scaletta. He's the one I've been telling you about. Come on, Lincoln, sit down. So you served in Vietnam, huh? Yes, sir. Sal tells me uh, you're on a few pieces of tin over there. Well, I served with some good men. Nothing I did would have happened without them. Army? Marines? Regular army at first, and then I was recruited to the 5th SFG. Special Forces. I told you it was something else. Now, not that anything's gonna go wrong, but just in case, goddamn, don't you want a man like that on your side? Well, if you're vouching for him, Sal, that's good enough for me. <laughs> Look, I got a couple things to take care of. Thanks for the drink. Christ, that guy's an asshole. <laughs> Fucking carpetbagger. Commission sent him down here from Empire Bay about 15 years back. He's been a pain in my goddamn ass ever since. Well, I guess you're wondering what this is all about. Yeah, Sammy didn't tell me too much. Twice a year, the feds take old money out of circulation and destroy it. Over the course of the next few days, that money's gonna be delivered here to the reserve in town. And you're gonna hit one of those shipments? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. 
we are gonna use that occasion to gain access to their vault. And then steal everything that ain't nailed down. <laughs> Should be six, seven million in there, easy. Following his murder of Carlo Falcone, Leo Galante would negotiate a deal on Vito's behalf to keep him alive by moving him out of Empire Bay into New Bordeaux, Louisiana, as a lieutenant for the Marcano crime family under Sal Marcano. An agreement Marcano was particularly displeased with, but agreed to nonetheless out of respect for Galante. Vito would spend the next 17 years running the River Road District of New Bordeaux under the suspicion of being a mole planted there by the Commission, but with Marcano unable to do anything about it due to Vito's status as a made man. In 1968, Vito would front a considerable amount of money to Marcano and do the legwork of obtaining a vault combination to the city's Federal Reserve, for a massive heist planned by Sal, his son Giorgio, members of the city's Irish mob under Thomas Burke, and the younger son of the man running the Delray Hollow district for Marcano, Mr. Lincoln Clay. The heist, however, would not go as most people involved expected, and instead exactly as Marcano intended, with he and his family being the only ones to emerge as victorious. Marcano would betray Lincoln and his son Giorgio would even shoot him in the head, but a man like Lincoln Clay was harder to put down than most, and he would survive the shot and spend the rest of the year carving a path of righteous revenge towards Marcano. Following the robbery, Vito would be left nearly broke, as he had fronted most of his savings for the initial startup costs, and although he would attempt to get his cut from Sal, he would very quickly realize that he likely never intended to actually hand it over. Marcano would then become far more brazen in his attempts to find justification for having Vito killed to the commission, by having his nephew, Michael Greco, muscle in on Vito's River Row rackets to make it look like Vito was failing to kick up his profits to sell. This would culminate in Greco's man attacking Vito at one of his few remaining fronts, Benny's Ristorante, with Vito being thrown into a freezer to die slowly. Until Lincoln Clay arrived. Looks like I got here just in time, Vito. Lincoln. How's this possible? I thought you were dead. The bullet was deflected by my skull. Came out the back. Talk about some goddamn luck. Worst place to shoot a fella's in the forehead. The skull's harder than you think. <clears throat> Come on. We need to have a talk. When I heard about what happened, I went to Marcano asking my cut right then and there. I figured if he fucked you and Sammy, I'd be next. Yeah, I'm guessing he didn't go for it. <laughs> Said he wanted to wait for the heat to die down. Didn't want me running around, buying expensive shit, getting noticed. Like I'm some fucking amateur, never sat on a big score before. That money I fronted for the robbery was pretty much everything I put away. Didn't have enough to run, so... I stayed. Commission wouldn't let him just kill me, so I figure I'd make that cocksucker jump through every hoop, make him prove I deserve to get whacked. It wasn't much, but it was something. I heard he brought in his nephew to push you out. A kid named Michael Greco. Nephew by marriage, not blood. Sure didn't number in here. Yeah. They were looking to see what other rackets I was running. I could leave a fucking paper trail in my office. Eh, don't bother with that shit. Look, uh... Appreciate you getting me out of the freezer and all, but, uh... What are you doing here? Marcano deserves to pay for what he did, so I'm going after him. Him, his brothers, his lieutenants, all of them. And I'm gonna need your help. Look, pretty much whittle me down to nothing. I mean, this is it. For now, maybe. But once I take back River Road from Greco, Money will start coming in, it'll be a different story. Also, we're partners now. As long as you do what I say and give me what I want when I want. <laughs> so goodbye, Marcano, hello, Lincoln Clay. It's either that or more of this. And next time, I won't be around to fish your ass out the freezer. Nobody kills that scumbag but me. You bring me Greco. I'm in. Tell me about his rackets. He took over the dock union and he's got a warehouse. He has a lot of valuable shit in there. You take both of them out. Greco's finished. A couple of my guys been keeping tabs on him. You should talk to them. They'll fill you in. All right. Oh, oh, please! I didn't do 
nothing. You didn't do nothing. You were getting ready to fucking kill me. I was just doing what Uncle Sal told me to do. Nah, that fuck never liked me. I get it. But this? You never tried anything like this before. I don't... I don't... Come on, Mikey. Why do you want me gone all of a sudden? He said you were a carpet baby. Never should have been down here in the first place. <laughs> you want me to keep going? You got nine more. Fuck! Listen, Jesus, he was worried you knew about the casino. And so we're gonna play up to Leo and the commission. What casino? Answer the question. Uncle Sally's. You, you, you see that construction across the lake? He's building a casino over there. He wants to go legit. Turn this city into Las Vegas. Gambling's illegal. Uh, yeah, no shit, it's illegal. Uh, which is why he's paid a bunch of money to get the laws changed. Who else is involved in this? I don't know. Uh, I don't know, I swear it. <laughs> Look, I, I told you what you wanted to know. You could have let me go now, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Stupid fucking prick. I'll clean this mess up. No reason for you to stick around. Remember our deal. I'm expecting to cut of everything you bring in. Hey, I know how this shit works. You'll get your money. There's a woman named Alma. Helps me out sometimes. Cuban. Mean as fuck. You should talk to her, see if she needs anything. Might be an easy way to bring in some extra money. So where's she at? At the warehouse. All right. What are you gonna do with him? Fish gotta eat like everyone else. Lincoln would recruit Vito into his own new organization aimed at replacing Marcano completely. And Vito, not at all new to that sort of thing, would happily agree so long as Lincoln agreed to give him the opportunity to personally murder Michael Greco. And Lincoln would do just that. Sometime that same year, in 1968, Vito would also ask Lincoln to personally find and assassinate five different men who were all in some capacity responsible for the brutal murder of his best friend, Joe Barbaro, sometime in the 50s. Though Vito would have done it himself, he'd spent a considerable amount of time and money tracking down the men who'd sold Joe out, after his apparent escape from Vinci's men following their murder of Carlo Falcone, and the men he was after would likely see him coming from a mile away. You could. My ma's bucatini recipe. I, know, I thought I'd give it a try. She back in Empire Bay? No, she, uh, she passed a while ago. You got any folks back there? Take a look at that paper. Some city councilman's up for re-election. I need a favor. Who is he? You tied up with Marcano? This fuck. Him and his pals killed a friend of mine. Look, he'd see me coming from a mile away. Oh yeah, because I'm so inconspicuous. You know how to get to people. It's taken me 12 years and a lot of money to find this cocksucker. I'd make it worth your while. And I'd consider it a personal favor. I'll think about it. If you're having trouble finding him, look for somebody on the street might be willing to give him up. When you're done, come back here. We got a lot more names that need to be X'd out. Joe would apparently wind up in Chicago and lie low with some mobster friends of his down there, but they would eventually betray him, cutting off his hands and murdering him in such a gruesome manner as to leave little to nothing left to bury when they were finished. Lincoln would eventually track down and murder all the men responsible including Chet Lucky Carbonale, Nestor Rourke, Polly Biancardi, Luca Guidi, and Dario Mortas, and allow Vito to finally get some small closure for his lost friend. That's what you get for following orders, right? It was a couple of years there, I didn't know if Joe was alive or what. When did you know? Maybe four or five years after I got sent down here. I still had a little pull back home, I kept some feelers out. I mean, word comes back, one of the guys I saw drive off with Joe's running his mouth. Can't hold his liquor. And someone heard him going on about some loudmouth Leo wanted him to put down. 
Yeah, that same loudmouth cost this guy his front teeth and cracked one of his eye sockets. Sounds like Joe didn't make it easy for him. You're goddamn right. Ain't no one taking Joe Barbaro down without a fight. <sighs> Joe managed to get loose. Was on a run for a while, went to Chicago, thinking a couple of guys up there would help him. Instead, they turned on him. Anyways, in the end, it went how it went. Beat the shit out of him, cut his fucking hands off. Smashed his face all to hell. When it was over, they didn't leave much for anybody to find. You sure it was Joe? If it wasn't him. If Joe was still alive, he would have found me by now. Eventually, Lincoln Clay would establish control over significant portions of the city of New Bordeaux, and make Vito one of his key lieutenants alongside head of the Haitian gang operations in Delray Hollow, Cassandra, and the head of the Irish mob in Point Verdun, Thomas Burke. According to our sources, Lincoln and Vito's shared connection over military service led Lincoln to be quite deferential to Vito when handing out territory as he slowly took over Marcano's former empire. Eventually, towards the end of 1968, Lincoln would succeed in one of the most elaborate revenge quests ever witnessed in the history of modern America, and take down Sal Marcano along with all of his capos and lieutenants. And almost immediately after doing so, he would apparently drop off the face of the earth, leaving New Bordeaux for unknown pastures, and leaving Vito in charge of more territory than the rest of his fellow lieutenants. Vito would eventually succeed in doing what Sal Marcano never could by finishing construction of the Paradiso Hotel and Casino, and only two years later opened a second casino in the city, which opened a floodgate for new development across the city and the state of Louisiana. Today, as you may know, New Bordeaux is known as the Vegas of the South, thanks to Vito Scaletta, who many say is still alive to this day and even at the ripe old age of 91, still has occasion to look out over the city he has owned for nearly half a century. After Lincoln vanished, Vito Scaletta took over the city. Now he spit on Sal Marcano's grape one last time by actually doing what Marcano couldn't, finishing the casino. Now two years later, Scaletta opened another casino and then it was just an avalanche of development. Hotels, uh, arenas, the new convention center, I mean, today, everyone knows this place as the Las Vegas of the South, but the whole damn thing was built on bodies Lincoln Clay left behind with blood money he and his lieutenants stole from the mob. And Vito? He still lives in that penthouse at the top of Marcano's casino, looking out over the city he owns. After Sam Marcano's death, Lincoln Clay disappeared. <laughs> the Bureau deprioritized the investigation after a few months, but uh, I keep an active file. In 1971, I tracked him to a California shipyard where he was working under an assumed name. By the time we got there, though, he was gone. Uh, the trail went cold, and by 77, 78, I figured he was dead. But then I got a report of someone matching his description working with the Colombians. Since then, uh, there's a new sighting of him every couple of years. Lincoln made it out to California, worked at the shipyards for a few years. Met him a woman. Seemed like he was gonna get married, but then it, it all came apart. Don't know why. And he started moving around. He went to Alaska, New York, South America. He even went back to Vietnam. Hmm. I, I still get postcards from time to time. You know, I think Lincoln wasn't able to, uh, Accept the world for what it is, or his place in it. So 
Someday, he's going to get tired of running or make a mistake. And I'll be waiting. I promise you that. According to our sources, it wouldn't take long for Vito to become discontent with the new order as run by Lincoln. And eventually, at some point in 1968, he would turn his gun on New Bordeaux's would-be king. And ultimately, it would not end well for him. Don't make this harder than it needs to be, Vito. The empty thing's empty anyway. Uh, I'd always thought you'd be different from those other cocksuckers. That fat Derek Papalotto, Alberto Clemente, Leo Galante, but no. Always somebody waiting to fuck me. Nobody forced you to get greedy. You could have sat back, been content, watched the money roll in. But no, nah, that wasn't enough for you. Fuck you. I gave up everything for this life. Everything. Look where I ended up. I deserve better. Fuck you! Despite his own military training and time in the Mafia, he would be no match for the unstoppable force that was Lincoln Clay, and he would be gunned down at Benny's Ristorante with his territories being taken over by Alma Diaz following his death. According to our sources, Lincoln Clay, unlike his predecessor Sal Marcano, would manage to establish a steady peace between himself and his three primary lieutenants, including Vito. And over the course of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, would expand his operation across the entire South, with Vito having control over about a third of Lincoln's rackets, from New Bordeaux to the southern tip of Florida. Even our most trusted sources could not verify what became of Vito Scaletta following Lincoln Clay's takeover of New Bordeaux. Perhaps it's because Vito was killed by Lincoln to consolidate his power. Perhaps it's because Vito chose to remain quiet and smart about any public appearances, and still wanders the streets of New Bordeaux's River Row to this day. We still aren't 100% sure, but know that the moment solid, verifiable information comes to light regarding Vito's life post-1968, we will be the first to report on it, and you, dear viewer, will be the first to hear of it. Vito Scaletta was a materialistic and equally sentimental mobster. Vito was raised in poverty both in Sicily and in America, and it was only through his own ambition and luck that he was able to raise himself out of that position. Though he would serve in the military, it would not be voluntarily, and this trend of being given less than ideal circumstances, forcing him to rise to the occasion, would only continue throughout his life. Perhaps due to his poverty and the way that he saw his father work himself to death for pennies, Vito would be more than willing from a young age to take what he wanted in order to get ahead and as long as those he cared about weren't harmed in the process, his conscience would be clear. He seemed to harbor a great deal of resentment for his late father, Antonio Scaletta, right up until learning about the true circumstances surrounding his death, in actuality murder. Even when his father was alive, he didn't seem to respect him much due to his failure to provide much for the family, but as Vito got older, and especially after he learned the truth, he seemed to soften on his old man for at least trying to do his best with the circumstances he was given, or at least often enough. Vito was not raised around organized crime, or rather, not raised inside of it, and as a result was incredibly naive when he was still a young man rising up through the ranks in Empire Bay. He would also be a brawler, despite his rather small size in comparison to many of the men he would face. Vito would always be prepared to take on somebody threatening him, his loved ones, or even just whoever's paying him, and through his military training or sheer determination, would always come out on top even when his opponent was twice his size. Vito held little to no loyalty to the concepts and traditions of the Mafia, and instead gave all of it to only his close friends. He seemed to participate in many of the Mafia's long-held customs out of a sense of obligation, rather than a pride in his heritage or actual interest in the rituals. He was always willing to break the rules to get ahead so long as he and those he cared for stood to benefit, and above all else was only loyal to his best friend Joe Barbaro until their forceful separation towards the end of 1951. Vito was highly protective of his mother and especially sister, getting into serious trouble to pay back his family's debt of $2,000, and more than once getting into physical altercations to either defend his sister or defend her honor as he saw it. 
This brutal and perhaps masochistic side of Vito seemed to only come out when he was particularly angry, and while Vito wasn't exactly hot-headed, when he was angry, he could bring down the almighty force of vengeance upon whoever had wronged him. Throughout his life, Vito never seemed interested in settling down with any one woman in particular, and instead seemed mostly to care for common luxuries like buying himself a villa in Greenfield or expensive new cars and clothes. He was a casual smoker and drinker, but never took these vices to extremes like his friend Joe or Eddie Scarpa. He was also no stranger to tough physical labor, having spent several years in the army, several more in prison, and several decades as a mobster doing things like burying bodies single-handedly whenever the need arose. There still remains some ambiguity in our investigations regarding Vito's life post-1968, but whatever the case, it can never be said that Vito Scaletta wasn't one of the most impactful mobsters to come out of Empire Bay's golden age of organized crime. Vittorio Scaletta operated as a gangster across Empire Bay and New Bordeaux primarily for over two decades at least. In that time, he managed to develop quite a reputation for being an effective killer when necessary, and as a result, also developed quite a substantial rap sheet for his many murders, among other crimes. We have attempted to compile a list here tonight of all the crimes we believe Vito Scaletta to be guilty of, but we must emphasize that he remains uncharged at the time of writing, and due to his extensive connections with the Empire Bay Commission, it seems likely that this will remain the case for the foreseeable future. He began his criminal career very early on, and thus it is impossible to know exactly what petty robberies he and Joe took part in during his early days. Just some of the charges we believe Vito should face would be Accessory to illegal tampering with military documents Assault when attacking the loan shark hired by Bruno Levine to shake down his sister Grand Theft Auto when stealing a 42 Jefferson and a Walter Coop his first day back from the war, the latter of which he sold to Mike Bruschi Accessory to extortion when shaking down dock workers for Derek Papalardo's barber fee Breaking and entering, grand theft, and illegal distribution of federal rations when stealing 10,000 gallons worth of gas stamps from the Office of Price Administration, and later selling them to various gas station attendants. Grand theft and likely murder when robbing the jewelry store Karat Kearney for Henry Tomasino, and killing several gangsters and policemen during their escape. Illegal purchase of a firearm, endangering the public, and murder when purchasing an MG42 from Harry Marsden and using it to ambush Sidney Penn and his men at his distillery, and eventually murdering Penn himself and many of his bodyguards alongside Joe Barbaro and Henry Tomasino. The murder of Brian O'Neill. Accessory to murder when burying the body of FBI agent Frankie Potts near the observatory in Hillwood. Selling contraband and murder when hawking cigarettes out of the back of a truck with Joe Barbaro, and later killing dozens of greasers when ambushed for selling on their turf. Numerous counts of murder when hunting down Luca Garino at his Clementi slaughterhouse and killing dozens of his men alongside Antonio Tony Balls Balsamo. Murder and terrorism when setting off a bomb at the Empire Arms Hotel alongside Joe Barbaro and killing many of Alberto Clementi's men, and accessory to murder when helping Joe to dispose of the body of a bartender he murdered in grief for the loss of his friend Marty Santorelli during the job. Assault and murder when initially attacking Eric Riley for abusing his sister and later murdering most of Riley's friends working for the Irish gang under Mickey Desmond. Purchasing a large quantity of heroin with intent to resell for profit, as well as murder when killing several Empire Bay triads and men posing as police officers to escape with the product. Distribution of said heroin to small-time dealers. The murder of countless Empire Bay triads and the near destruction of the Red Dragon restaurant in Chinatown, as well as the murder of high-ranking Tong's enforcer, Se Yun Wang. Accessory to the murder of Thomas Angelo outside his home in Greenfield. The murder of Steve Coyne, Derek Papalardo, and numerous bodyguards working for Derek, as well as the theft of nearly $50,000 from Derek's office following his murder. The murder of Carlo Falcone and countless Falcone family associates. Racketeering when running several illegal businesses for Sal Marcano out of the River Road District in New Bordeaux. The murder and torture of Michael Greco. Ordering the murders of Chet Lucky Carbonale, Nestor Rourke, Polly Bincardi, Luca Guidi, and Dario Mortas for the role in the death of Joe Barbaro. Racketeering when running several more illegal businesses for Lincoln Clay out of the River Road District and several other districts of New Bordeaux. Vito Scaletta is in many ways a more typical mobster than the previous subject we examined on this program from his same world, Tommy Angelo. He rose through the ranks of both the military and various criminal organizations with relative ease, always managing to keep his cool enough to get the job done and earning a substantial reputation for doing so in the process. Whatever became of Vito Scaletta, it seems unlikely that the criminal underground of Empire Bay or New Bordeaux will forget about him anytime soon.
This documentary was produced with cooperation from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and would not have been possible without the aid of Agent Jonathan McGuire and his extensive research into the likes of Lincoln Clay, Sal Marcano, and of course, dear old Vito. Tonight was only but a taste though, dear viewer, as my team and I have been working extensively with Agent McGuire to produce a truly provocative and groundbreaking exploration of the life of one of Vito's colleagues, Mr. Lincoln Clay. We have conducted interviews with people who personally knew Mr. Clay, used the testimony of his CIA war buddy John Donovan, and consulted at every opportunity with Agent McGuire to bring you something that will truly change the way you look at organized crime in the U.S. during the late 20th century. We look forward to bringing that program to you as soon as production has come to a close, but in the meantime, consider supporting our work here at A Criminal History by signing up to our Patreon to see videos early and get access to all of the original music produced for the show and our sister series. I've been your host, Guinness Walker, and I thank you for joining me here tonight, dear viewer. I'll see you next time for another hard-hitting edition of A Criminal History. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.